Hey there everybody, I'm Joe's Disney Guy and welcome to another Disney Guy review. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of Disney's most ambitious but ultimately one of their most disastrous animated films, The Black Cauldron. Disney was still in the midst of its massive transition in the post-Walt era, and in the early 70s, with their animation team getting older and looking for an overhaul, the studio was in search of a film that would not only be successful, but could also mark the beginning of a new age of Disney animation. Enter The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander, a popular five novel series based on Welsh mythology that was written in the mid-60s. Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas, two of Disney's remaining nine old men, pleaded with the studio to turn The Chronicles of Prydain into an animated movie, claiming that, if done correctly, the film had the potential to be this generation's Snow White. With this in mind, the studio optioned the novels in 1971, and after acquiring the rights, began pre-production in 1973. Alright, let's pause for a second and address the first major issue that this film faced. Look, I love Frank and Ollie and all, but anytime you start throwing around the name Snow White before pencils even hit the paper, you're setting some pretty lofty and realistically unattainable expectations. The studio, also in need of attracting young, talented animators, used the prospect of this potentially generation-defining animated film, now being called The Black Cauldron, as a means to excite and recruit new talent to the studio. However, almost immediately the film was bogged down by production troubles, partially due to the influx of inexperienced animators. Design artist Mel Shaw came up with early concept art for the film, but studio head Ron Miller deemed it to be too complicated for the current staff. The young animators also struggled with creating realistic human characters, and with all that in mind, in August of 1978, the film's 1980 release date was pushed all the way to 1984. Alright, second major issue here. Back in the 30s when Walt went ahead with the ambitious Snow White project, his animators had been in the studio for a few years, working on things like Silly Symphonies, experimenting and learning the skills that they would need to pull off this massive Snow White project. Here, Disney was trying to do something on the same scale, but in a far more competitive landscape for animation, and primarily with kids who were fresh out of college. I promise I'm not going to do this for the whole review, but once again, unrealistic expectations. Various attempts were made to breathe life back into the Black Cauldron, with storyboard artist Vance Gary tasked with simplifying the script, and even famed screenwriter Rosemary Ann Sisson was hired to give the script a British voice. Relative newcomer John Clements was given the role of director, but faced early criticism when his scenes were deemed to be too comedic. Art Stevens, Richard Rich, Tim Berman, and Dave Michener, fresh off Fox and the Hound, joined as animation directors for the project, but this caused further rifts among the staff over the direction of the film. Ron Miller didn't like how clustered everything was becoming, so he brought in veteran layout artist Joe Hale to be the film's producer. Finally, with all the staff in place, production on The Black Cauldron began in earnest in 1980. Immediately upon production, Joe Hale and his team began to try and sort out and simplify the story and direction of The Black Cauldron. They focused in on two of the five novels of the Chronicles of Prydain, identifying the elements that they believed would make for the most concise story, and with that in mind, began to pinpoint and refine their main characters. Early concept art for the lead characters was submitted by Tim Burton, but Hale instead elected to coax Nine Old Men veteran Milt Call out of retirement to handle the character designs for the project. What's interesting about this decision is that, although hard to argue with on paper, it definitely prevented the film from having its own unique look and feel. Yes, Burton's drawings, as expected, are a little out there, but at least they were different. As Alejandro Dejas points out, Milk Cole himself identified as a refiner, not a concept artist, so when tasked to come up with character designs without any new inspiration to go off of, Milt sort of relied on making amalgamations of former characters that he's worked on. Taron, for example, is Peter Pan meets Mowgli, and Elanwi almost intentionally is Princess Aurora all over again. And speaking of Sleeping Beauty, Hale decided that the darker, gothic look of that film would be the template for The Black Cauldron, and even made the decision for The Black Cauldron to be Disney's first animated film to be shot on 70mm widescreen since Sleeping Beauty. 
major changes were made to the villain and story as well. In Van Scary's reimagining of the Black Cauldron, he made the villainous Horned King into a large, hot-tempered Viking. But Hale instead elected to give the Horned King qualities of a number of villains from the book series, elevating his status to the story's main villain and giving him a much darker and more mysterious design. And in matching this new design, the story itself began to get darker as it continued to be reworked by Hale and his writing team. Not everyone was on board with these changes though, which saw the departures of Rosemary Ann Sisson, John Musker, and Ron Clements from the project, all citing creative differences. There's some context that needs to be explained with this darkening of the story. Usually Disney is all for lighthearted fair, but we have to remember the time period and what was going on around it. You see, Disney had lost its stranglehold on family entertainment to the likes of Star Wars and Indiana Jones, and in the animation space, you know that the executives at Disney were keeping a close eye on a little film called The Secret of Nim, which was being worked on by Don Bluth. Teen demographics were pretty much deciding the market, and to them, Dark was in, and your typical Disney comedy was out. Despite leaning on Sleeping Beauty as a visual guideline, major technological steps in animation were taken throughout the creation of The Black Cauldron. Initially, there were plans for The Black Cauldron to be the first animated film to feature holographic imagery, with the idea that one of the Cauldron Born would hover over the audience. Despite positive tests though, the decision was made to axe the idea when it became apparent that most theaters wouldn't be able to handle the costs associated with having a 3D projector. One technological advancement that didn't fall by the wayside, however, was the Animation Photo Transfer Process, or APT process, developed by David W. Spencer. All right, real quickly, here's the basics of the APT process. The APT process was supposed to replace xerography as the fastest and easiest way to transfer drawings onto cells in full color. Although it didn't exactly replace xerography, computers did a pretty good job of that on their own, it was still quite the technological breakthrough and certainly worthy of its Technical Academy Award. The Black Cauldron was also on the forefront of computer-generated imagery. Upon hearing about CGI being used for Disney's other animated film in the pipeline, The Great Mouse Detective, Joe Hale was excited about the process and asked for CGI to be used in their own movie. In the end, CGI was used to create Elonwi's Bubble and the titular Cauldron, making The Black Cauldron the first animated film to be released using CGI. So again, let the record show that The Great Mouse Detective was actually the first Disney animated film to use CGI. Black Cauldron just happened to be released first. Also pretty cool was that the animators used live action footage of dry ice to create the smoke that was coming out of the cauldron itself. That sort of blending of live action and CGI for effects isn't really something that we see anymore considering how good CGI is these days. Voice acting went a different direction than usual for Disney Animation, as none of the typical mainstays made an appearance in the Black Cauldron. Instead, a group of actors mostly from the world of British television was assembled to voice the main cast with Grant Bradley as Tarin, Susan Sheridan as Alonwi, and Nigel Hawthorne as Fleur de Flamme. The music was also handled by a Disney Outsider, with the score composed and conducted by acclaimed film composer Elmer Bernstein. Honestly, I'm all for new voices in the world of Disney. Though that being said, there was quite the departure in star power, at least from an American audience perspective, when you consider that Mickey Rooney and Kurt Russell were in Disney's last flick. As for the score, well, can't argue with results, Bernstein's work on the Black Cauldron to this day is still critically acclaimed. But all throughout production, the Black Cauldron continued to be cursed by numerous setbacks. Early on in the animation process, it was discovered that the animators were using the wrong dimensions of cells for the 70mm frames, causing weeks of work to have to be redone. Then, in 1982, as a way to try and keep animated jobs from being outsourced overseas, the Animators Guild went on strike, setting back production another 10 weeks. But the biggest upheaval to the Black Cauldron's production came due to a major shift at the top of the Disney company. In September of 1984, Ron Miller, who had been a staunch defender of the Black Cauldron from its inception, resigned from his CEO position, and former president of Paramount Pictures, Michael Eisner, was brought in to replace him. Soon after, Eisner appointed former Paramount executive Jeffrey Katzenberg to take charge of Disney's motion pictures. Again, there's a ton to unpack here about the shift at the top of Disney that I promise we'll get to in the near future, but for now, here's the basics of what you need to know. 
Despite their successful movie careers, Eisner and Katzenberg were not animation guys. Which definitely posed a problem, especially if you were part of an animation team that was currently working on a beleaguered and pretty expensive animated film. Soon after the power change at the top, the Black Cauldron was ready for a test screening, which was held in Burbank, California. Unfortunately, Disney's first animated PG film wasn't well received, culminating in terrified children and upset parents leaving the theater upon the uncharacteristically scary cauldron born scene. Upon seeing this reaction, Katzenberg immediately ordered that the film be edited, both to make it less scary and to bring down the runtime. Hale objected to the order, explaining that animated films couldn't just be edited like live action films. Katzenberg, frustrated with Hale's explanation, decided to take the film to an edit bay himself and started to cut parts out of the movie before Eisner called and convinced him to stop. In the end, the movie was delayed seven months to July of 1985, and all told, 12 minutes would eventually be cut from the movie. So let's talk about this little dispute for a second. Was Hale right that you can't edit an animated film? Well, no, even Snow White very famously had some entire scenes taken out of it. So what was the reason for his explanation? Well, in Hale's defense, it is highly unusual to edit a film that's already been fully animated. Why is that? Well, animating scenes cost a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So when you start taking those scenes out, or even worse, if you have to start reanimating them, it's pretty cost inefficient. That's why most edits on animated films, especially during that time, were made during the Leica Reel stage, which are basically moving storyboards so you can get a sense for how the movie is flowing. That way, if you have to make edits, you can make it to storyboards, not to fully animated scenes. But finally, after numerous delays and over four and a half years of development, The Black Cauldron hit theaters on July 24th, 1985. Black Cauldron. So that's it. The Black Cauldron? An awesome weapon, Tyron. So when they first started working on The Black Cauldron, people at the Disney studio truly believed that it would be their next Snow White. So, was it? Well, to put it mildly, no. The Black Cauldron is nowhere near the generational importance of Snow White, at least in a positive sense. But let's start with what I did like about the film. The look and feel of the film is definitely darker than any Disney film prior, aside from maybe the night on Bald Mountain scene in Fantasia. And considering that they were going for a dark feel, that's definitely commendable. And the high part of the film is absolutely the visual effects. From something as simple as the ball bowl to the incredible cauldron born sequence, the effects the animators used are pretty stunning and look unique from anything we've seen in a Disney movie before. And also, maybe it's just residual feelings I have from Sleeping Beauty, but something about the film being in widescreen just makes it feel more epic, so bonus points for that. But here's the issue. Once we get past the look and feel of the film, there's really not a lot here. Although the animation can be unique at times, nothing really sets the characters or story of Black Cauldron apart from other animated films that we've seen. The characters are surprisingly cookie cutter, and by the end of the movie, I found myself asking what it was that I even knew about these characters. All we know about Princess Elanwy, for example, is that she's pretty, and we only know that because it's said by multiple characters throughout the movie. Even the Horned King, who is one of the cooler and more unique looking villains in Disney history, really leaves no lasting impact, which is a shame considering the potential that this villain had. I think what annoys me even more though is that the character arc of Gurgi, a clearly secondary character, far outpaces the character arc of Tarin, our main character. From beginning to end, Tarin starts as a headstrong teenager who wants to become a great warrior, and ends by giving up his magical sword for his friend. Nothing that we haven't seen before, but at least you can say that it was some length of a heroic act that we didn't see in the character earlier. Meanwhile, Gurgi starts as this selfish con artist who only looks out for himself and ends by sacrificing his life to save his new friends. I mean, come on, guys. When I was younger, I wasn't the biggest fan of Gurgi. I actually found him quite annoying. But now that I look back at it, Gurgi's the real hero of this story. I mean, he sure beats the heck out of Princess Elanui, who does. What does she do in this movie exactly? But where I think this film really falls down is in its story which again is a shame because of the rich source material it was based off of. 
Like I said before, there's not a lot of new that this movie story brings to the genre. But even worse than that is the amount of hanging plot devices and just unexplained elements throughout the film. I've argued in the past on this channel about wanting more explanation from films, but this one is definitely the worst offender of the ones I've come across so far. I mean, right off the bat, we see that the Horned King is in power, but how? And if he's in power, then what's the story with Princess Elonwi's parents? Is she even really a princess? I mean, the Horned King calls her a scullery maid, but was that just an insult, or is that true? And oh yeah, if the Horned King is already in power, then what does he even want with the cauldron anyway? Unless maybe I misinterpreted the Horned King being in power, but there's certainly no mention of other rulers in the kingdom, so he must be in power, no? Literally, I just asked six questions that never get answered or explained in the slightest, all from the first 20 or so minutes of the movie. I mean, if that's not indicative of your story having a few holes in it, then I don't know what is. And in addition to the abundance of plot holes, there's other elements introduced throughout the story that could be interesting, but are never really followed through on. For example, Alonwi has a magical bauble that we not only never learn the origins of, but it also never even factors into the story, aside from helping to light the dungeon. And then there's the Fair Folk, who, again, get introduced to the story, but are only in the film for around 5 minutes, and really only serve to get the characters from point A to point B. Something they could have done without introducing an entire new group of characters. And yes, I understand that the Fair Folk were the primary victims of the 12 minutes that were cut out of the film, but if you're going to cut out almost all of their scenes and purpose in the movie, then why not just go all the way and cut them from the film entirely? And of course, The Black Cauldron features one of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to story, and that's poor pacing. Almost everything in this movie moves too fast, from the relationship between the characters to the actual story beats themselves. One of the biggest pacing missteps, in my opinion, is revealing the Horned King within the first 20 minutes. Instead of allowing for his mystique to grow throughout the film, much like what Disney did with Shere Khan in The Jungle Book, we get to meet the Horned King so early that it sort of kills any fear and mystery the character could hold, especially because it's not like he does anything particularly dastardly in their initial meeting to convey to the audience that he's this ruthless character who they should be afraid of. I also thought that the climax of the movie came upon us real quickly, but I suppose when everything else in the film feels like it's moving too fast, it only makes sense for the climax too as well. So in the end, we're left with a film that, though visually impressive, has just too many issues with its story and characters to look past. It's weird, because it feels like Disney was trying to make a non-Disney movie, and maybe that's a side effect of a team of new animators trying to make their mark on Disney history. But what it instead created was ensuring that the Black Cauldron would go down as the Black Sheep of Disney animation. Upon its release, the Black Cauldron already had its back against the wall due to its inflated budget. The movie was budgeted for $25 million, but ran its cost up to $44 million before production was over, making it the most expensive animated film ever made at the time of release. Just for comparison's sake, The Black Cauldron cost $44 million to make, while The Rescuers, released only 8 years earlier, cost $7.5 million, so yeah, pretty expensive movie. Unfortunately, initial reviews didn't help Black Cauldron's cause, as despite the praise reviewers had for the film's visuals, reviews were generally poor, saying that The Black Cauldron was ambitious, but disappointing. The box office numbers compounded the issue, as Black Cauldron scraped together a meager $4 million in its opening weekend, good for fourth at the box office, and made only $21.3 million in its initial release. This massive loss threw the future of Disney's animation department into doubt, and forced the studio to rethink how they made animated features. There is no getting around what a financial disaster this film was. I mean, for crying out loud, the Care Bears movie outdrew it. But if there is one benefit, if you could call it that, to this situation, is that this embarrassing turn of events did pretty much force the Disney studio to hit the reset button, and it helped set the stage for the renaissance to come. Aside from being the first Disney animated film to receive its own full-length video game, a Sierra Online developed computer game, Due to the film's financial failures, Disney hasn't exactly featured The Black Cauldron much outside of its initial release. The Black Cauldron was never re-released in the theaters, 
and it took until 1997 for the film to even receive a home video release in the UK, with the US not getting a VHS release until 1998. There's also been scarce black cauldron presence in the parks, with the Horn King making a small appearance in Cinderella's Castle Mystery Tour in Tokyo Disneyland, and Gurgi's Munchies and Crunchies Counter Service Restaurant existing in Walt Disney World's Fantasyland from 1986 through 1993. So despite its grand expectations of being the next generation Snow White, Black Cauldron will instead be remembered for the bottoming out of Disney animation. But in a weird way, the failure of the Black Cauldron proved to be a necessary speed bump in Disney's road back to animated supremacy. Well guys, that wraps up for me this week. Hope you all enjoyed and let me know what your thoughts are about the Black Cauldron. Also be sure to subscribe to the channel, follow me on Twitter, and if you feel like supporting this channel even more, check out my Patreon page where you can see your name in the end credits, get reviews a day early, and even more goodies. Also be sure to check out my last video, check out the Disney Guy Review playlist, and any other sort of videos that YouTube has popping up around me. And I'll see you all real soon.